Welcome to Wolf Haven's Pat Dunn Prairie Fundraiser. I'm Diane Gallegos, Executive Director at Wolf Haven International. I clearly remember one of the first times I met with Pat Dunn. We walked the path out to the grandfather tree on our beautiful Mima Mound Prairie, and by the time we ended our walk, I had been captured by Pat's vision for our beautiful prairie. We're so pleased to have several of our prairie colleagues joining us for this fundraiser, and we're so happy to have your support. Patrick began his career with the Nature Conservancy and he worked with them for 25 years before moving on to the Center for Natural Lands Management. I think once he started and he, he saw his purpose as making a corridor or connecting habitats so that animals would be able to migrate from one place to another. One of his biggest accomplishments was probably glacial heritage. I do recall that when we first drove out there to see it, the scotch room was over our heads and there was no way that you could walk or drive through it. And of course, through some efforts between all the different agencies, he was able to start restoring that and by far has been one of the better uh, works that he's ever done. However, there are several other uh, preserves that he worked on. Obviously, he did work with Woolhaven to facilitate the restoration of your prairies. This was Pat's life. Um, he loved his work. He was passionate about ensuring that the next generation had a possibility to see the beauty in the prairies. And I do think that his work is remembered here and is remembered by many people. And I hope that everyone that comes through enjoys his accomplishments. When we think of the Pacific Northwest, we conjure up thoughts of conifer forests and mountains and rivers and streams. And one of the more special ecosystems that we have here in the Pacific Northwest are these South Puget Sound prairies, which were culturally managed by the Native Americans through burning practices. They knew that it would increase the production of the camas bulbs, which was a major food source for them. Plus, it was a way to know that when new sprouts of vegetation came up from those burned areas, there would be a preponderance of wild game that would come to these areas and use it for forage. They were very intelligent in terms of the practices that they incorporated to keep the forest at bay and to have the prairies flourish. So when you're talking about Squaiayesk people in particular, or Chehalis people, um, kind of inextricably linked to the prairies, we are prairie people. And our relationship with our neighbors, the Squaliopsh to the north and Tlapuamesh to the south, you know, the Nisqually and the Cowlitz had this vast network that was not only beneficial for trade, but also just cooperative management of everything we needed to survive, you know, back in the day. So the prairies, as far as we know, ran from basically Squally Territory, JBLM, all the way down south of Centralia. And that was one vast network for food, for fiber, for medicine. That was home. That was the place to be. When the settlers came over and they saw 
Camas prairies and they just thought they were untouched, right? But they looked that way because of how we had maintained them for so long. And I think it's just important to recognize that human beings can actually do good and be good with the environment if we do it in a meaningful way. And prairies and ecosystems that have traditional foods like Camas can really highlight what that looks like. And so as we move towards restoration and reclaiming the urban landscape, I think showing the progression of what that tending and interaction looks like will get people to see what that means and how you can change the landscape back to not what it once was, but try to get it back there anyways. Um, I just think that that can be eye-opening to many people. Was at one time perhaps 30,000 acres of prairies in about 1850 and then the European man came upon the landscape and we, we considered fire as a danger and that we wanted to stop fires and so the fires were pretty much halted in these grassland ecosystems and since that occurred we do like a back of the envelope kind of calculation. We can say we lost approximately 100 acres of prairie annually for over 150 years. We've seen a huge disconnect, and I mean that in a lot of different ways. Um, not only have the prairies been sort of literally disconnected from each other with uh, you know, the encroachment of the trees that have come in and logging practices that have erased other parts, but then also the agricultural use has kind of completely depleted the way the, the, the prairies would have been connected. And then also because of that sort of newfound land use that's been happening in the last 150, 170 years, it's also disconnected the people that were managing the prairies for you know, centuries, if not millennia. It really wasn't until uh, the late 80s, early 90s, when we really recognized that the practice of prescribed fire was probably the best treatment that we could use to promote the long-term uh, sustainability of our South Puget Sound prairies. thing about prescribed burning is a it removes and kills scotch broom and then b sets the stage for native seeding effective native seeding managing scotch broom we've done it here um, we'll continue to keep the seedlings from ever setting seed again and hopefully eventually it's just such a small effort that we don't have a lot to do um, again in the in the beginning i remember spending days and days and weeks out here pulling and spraying broom actually in the early days now it's just a couple, maybe three volunteer events a year, and we're able to pull the entirety of the prairie. And we've been able to do, over the last 12 years, I think, it's been 12 years, two complete iterations of fire across Wolf Haven. Um, so each year we burn about six acres, and we march around and do that over the last 12-ish years. And we're seeing the response in diversity of natives. Um, so it's far more diverse and far more native than it was when we started. I've spent the past five years following how the changes in the plant communities in these prairies and the changes in the flowering communities in these prairies affect pollinators. Bees, flower flies, beetles, um, all the insects that depend on these plants and the reason why I get excited about that is because 
restoration is a really young practice and a lot of the attention in restoration has been focused on making sure that we're bringing back a plant community, a native plant community, which is the essential piece. But the interesting follow on to that is what about all the other organisms that depend on those plants? If you build um, or rebuild a native plant community, do the pollinators show up? Do you actually get greater pollinator diversity? And thankfully, the exciting answer is yes, you do. But the other reason that it's important to study how pollinators respond to restoration is from the plant perspective, because the plants themselves depend on the pollinators. Not all plants are dependent on pollinators. We have some plants that can self-pollinate and some plants that are pollinated by wind. But in our prairies, roughly 80 to 85 percent absolutely can't produce any seeds unless pollinators show up. And so it's not just that we care about the pollinators themselves, we have to care about the pollinators in order to make sure that the success of our restoration isn't just temporary. We want these plants not to just live out their lifetimes, we want them to create seed and have new generations of plants that are self-sustaining. I do believe it is extremely important um, for my second graders not to be afraid of bees. You know, bees as pollinators, you know, they always run away from them. And as we talk more about their importance, I think it's significant for them, not only not to be afraid, but to appreciate the ecosystem as a whole. That's always a tricky question when you get into like, what's, what's the critical species or critical group of species that sort of drive an ecosystem? I, you know, those, that is an important question. I think it's also important that we just want to maximize the number of species because they all are interconnected in ways that we don't always know about. So one species that here is the pocket gopher, known relatively well as a systems engineer. So it's burrowing through the ground, uh, it's creating bare ground on the soil. That opens opportunities for plant and seed germination. It opens opportunities for other animals to use either as shelter or places that they can access for protection. One group of species that I like to emphasize with gophers are some of the ground nesting birds. So we have a number of species, savannah sparrows, Oregon Vesper Sparrow and Street Torn Larks that require bare ground to move around and to forage. And so pocket gophers were probably a pretty critical element to those species being around. One of the unique things about Wolfhaven's bat colony is that it came out of thin air, as we kind of talk about it, which of course is not true. The bats are obviously in the region, but they discovered these bat boxes that we put here. There wasn't a large colony like this on the Wolfhaven property. After we put in these bat boxes, within the first year, it got, the first summer, it started getting used by bats. And um, there were only 30 or 40 the first year. The next year, there were about double that. And after several years, there was a full-fledged colony of mostly little brown bats and, and some Yuma bats mixed in. And now it's about 400 bats every summer, mostly uh, little brown bats. Bats provide a number of ecological and economic benefits. These bats here are smaller bats that likely are eating mosquitoes and midge and small insects. So one of the benefits to humans is they do help control uh, mosquito populations. 
not right here, but at the places that they're foraging. So nearby lakes and ponds where the mosquitoes are reproducing, these bats will go to and feed heavily on there and they really make a dent in their populations. Prairie ecosystems are important because they're really rare. They used to be widespread and they're much rarer now. I mean, we're now looking at about 3%. 3%. 3 percent of our prairies remaining. And of that 3%, Less than 1% is in good quality. Some people might say, well, you know, they'll just get rarer and rarer and why bother? You know, if nothing were to happen, all of them would be covered with conifer trees eventually. That's the end climax um, habitat type in the area. What gives me hope is that we are building these sort of interagency agreements. We're allowed to access different places now, which is cool. Um, our cultural practices like the pyroecology and the burning of the prairies has been revived. As we're out here on this prairie in particular and we're providing the care to the land, it's simultaneously providing healing back to those that are taking care of it. And it's important to maintain that connection and, and feel it and understand it and ask questions because as people come out here and start tending and caring, it's opening up this relationship that has been on this land and had been on this land for thousands of years prior before it was removed. And so that feeling and that relationship is still very much there. Now, to keep them, we need to continue a, either a fire regime, management regime. Um, and so that takes money. Um, if, if you were to walk away from the prairies, again, they, they turn to conifer habitat. Um, so having long-term funding in place is one of the methods where we can make sure prairies persist forever. I'm Saunders Freed. I work for <laughs> okay. okay, let's try that again. I shouldn't laugh through it all. Are we serious? Is this a serious video? Mm -hmm. Are we, really? Yeah. You know I'm not serious about much. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, I'm not, I can't be serious. I have to just laugh my way through this because that's how I operate. Otherwise, I'll get, it'll get weird. Okay, okay. We have to try not to make me laugh. I can't be laughing in the background. Okay. Uh, so, <laughs> why can't I just say my name on the video it underneath? Was simple, but okay, simple. I'm Saunders. <laughs> I think we can use the first. We can use yeah, the first one. <laughs> okay. Oh, oh. <laughs> okay, ask me a different okay. question. I don't like that one. Yeah, right. that one is dumb. <laughs> Irrelevant too. <laughs>